My name's Julian Holmes, I'm from ThoughtWorks. Uh, quick show of hands, who was here last year and attended the lightning talks last year? Okay, so you'll have seen me spend five minutes having a really big rant about this topic for five minutes last year. Uh, and on the basis of that, I was allowed back for some strange reason. But uh, my topic is about agile methods are dangerous. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is uh, recreate some scenarios and things you might hear in organisations and try to explain maybe what's going on, what's behind that, and what it is that maybe we can learn from and maybe do about that. Uh, so as it says, I work for ThoughtWorks. Just one quick slide. Uh, majority of our organisation is about software delivery. We are a software delivery with excellence co company. We're really well known for agile DevOps principles, practices, etc. Uh, but there's a small number of us in the organisation, or small percentage of us, who are involved in helping organisations be more like ThoughtWorks, as in be capable of delivering like we do. And maybe that's where my experiences come from, and hopefully that's what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, so, don't get me wrong, agile methods do deliver value, yeah? I mean, they are useful but they can also be very dangerous for many different reasons and many different ways. Uh, there are a lot of these typical dangers and I'm going to get a few quotes around all of them. Uh, and obviously for those quotes, hopefully you'll be able to see and hear very quickly why they're perhaps they're wrong. Uh, equally, I want to give you some ideas about strategy about how to change that conversation. So that, that, that quote you hear it can become something really useful for you in the organisation you're working with. Uh, and, you know, some of this might just sound like common sense, but I'm sure you all know the, the Voltaire quote, mis misquoted. Uh, the problem with common sense is it's not very common. So uh, let's see if we can inject some of that, though, as we go today. So, as I said, they're, they're everywhere, and I'm going to go through five or six quotes. Hopefully you'll recognise some of these and we can talk about them. Here comes the first one. Okay, so uh, they're absolutely dogmatically fixed on something they've maybe learnt. I chose fundamentalist. You could switch the first few letters with many other method types, I'm sure, but you see a lot of that through that, that pathway of the, the two-day sheep dip indoctrination of this is how everything must be. Uh, and of course, we must make sure that we're not just dogmatic about what we learn. We're not dogmatic about how we apply this stuff. You need to apply context. You need to be able to think about the environment in which you're in. So we must make sure that people are thinking about the, the values and principles behind Agile, and particularly those methods too. Those methods have got really great values and principles behind them. It's those things that we really need to be thinking about, not the specific actions and tasks that, be, that get stated as examples of how to achieve that, those values and principles. You know, we just do not w want this religious war between methods or people trying to indoctrinate others with the religion that they've just been taught the day before uh, in their two-day mastery course, of course. Uh, so you've got to be wary of those zealots and make sure that you are able to deal with them. Uh, obviously, there is no one method to rule them all, okay? There are favourite methods, there are methods that seem to be doing well, but no one method is going to work perfectly in every context you find yourself. Again, behind most methods, actually, a lot of the principles and the things they're trying to achieve are pretty much identical if they belong to that family of Agile methods. So let's think about, is there a practice from here? Is there a concept within here? Is there a way of getting people to collaborate in this method that are the right combination for you and what you're doing in your organisation? Equally, when we look at that Agile Manifesto, I, I gave this talk a few weeks ago and somebody said, oh, does this mean the Agile Manifesto is irrelevant then? I don't know where he got that idea from, uh, just because I said methods are challenging. But if you think about the manifesto and those values you get on the first page, you all, I assume you all know there's a second page because so many people have never looked at it. Uh, the first page, those four value statements, you've got to find somewhere on each of those value statements that reflects where you are or where you're capable of moving to. And that's really important, making sure you understand that clearly. So the practice is making the right choices and getting the right value from in the, in the correct context is so important. How are you going to make that decision? Well, equally, it's going to have to come from experience. 
you are not going to be able to come off those courses. I heard somebody mention this earlier, I think it was John on stage earlier on the same stage, talking about how uh, just being able to take on a set of information and then get back to the office two weeks later and realize everything sounded perfect in the classroom, but now I'm trying to apply it in the real world. How on earth do I do that? So experience really helps. Obviously, best way of finding this out is by trying it. If you can get a bit of assistance in to help you, some experience too, maybe that's going to help you even more. Okay, so I'm, am I back in rant mode again? I think it feels like I am, but I'm going to keep going because some of these quotes really do wind me up. So why don't we move on to the, uh, move on to the next one. I, asked, I, I did a, some, a similar uh, conversation in, uh, in Bosnia, and I, I asked the audience, uh, so everybody knows what RTFM stands for, yeah? The, the, and I said the F, and they shout the, the literal word back at me. That was not the polite version I was looking for. Read the fricking manual, yeah? So. Uh, it's not about having a defined set that everybody must follow to the letter. More method is not better method. Uh, so big methods, we've, we've learned there have been many people and many efforts in the industry to create big methods that have failed. And I must admit, I'm guilty as charged in some respects. Anybody ever heard of that thing called RUP, the Rational Unified Process? There's a few people looking scared at the mention of that word. Uh, I must admit, being involved in a community that was trying to really make that work. My work, though, was about reducing 2,000 pages down to about 50. Uh, 50 was still too big. But the ideas and the concepts behind things like the Rational Unified Process were really sound. It was just how they were communicated and how people interpreted them that went so wrong. But equally, the only people reading the whole method were the people writing it, which is not very helpful. You, know, you really need people to feel that it's useful to them, that they can take on this information and gain value from it. So just reading the freaking manual is not actually going to make a difference for a lot of people because they won't. They just don't won't. They're too busy to want to go and read that kind of stuff. Uh, so if we're going to write anything down, let's make sure we start light. Okay, Start light. Just start with the basic things that we want people to work, work to. Some basic, simple, agreed ways in which we're going to collaborate and work effectively together. Just so that everybody's on the same, on the same page, singing from the same hymn book. We just heard about metaphors next door, didn't we? But uh, yeah. Uh, this, this was posted as a workshop wrong. It's not. You don't, don't get scared. Uh, so um, what we need to do, though, is make sure that it's roughly right what we're asking for, as opposed to trying to overdefine it and end up putting something in, in words that is just accurately wrong. Uh, you can apply that in many agile contexts, in fact, that whole phrase, uh, roughly right versus accurately wrong. How many, peop how many people here have seen so much effort put into estimating? Yeah, yeah, hours and hours and hours trying to estimate something so it's really accurately wrong, as opposed to a few minutes thinking about something that's roughly right. Please don't know that. OK, so, uh, and. Equally, really importantly, if you get something that's roughly right, you actually encourage other people with the experience and the knowledge to contribute how to fill those gaps. I think it's really important to actually have those gaps there so people feel they're part of that definition, that loose definition, because people feel they own it or they're part of it, they're more likely to follow it because it's theirs. So uh, if it is working, let's make sure it's collaboratively shared. You know, I, I'm really a big believer in collaborative working documents, you know, wiki, old style wiki, uh, Wikimedia things, or whether it's now just using a simple collaborative documents like Google Docs, etc. Let's just make sure, Confluence, you know, name so many different types of uh, tool to do that. But a space that anybody has the right to edit and change. It cannot be the, uh, the area of, of, the, of the methodological tower that people live at the top of. Uh, trying to put down their good word on every beneath them that must be followed. No, it's got to be the people's thing that they create together. So use the collaborative wiki. A trick I used a few times uh, trying to get people to engage in that work on the wiki is put a nice, very, very light set of information there, <coughs> but some obvious holes and maybe some obvious inaccuracies where you'd like somebody to contribute. And make sure that the person who's best able to contribute to that, who might be most passionate about the fact you made that mistake and it's obviously wrong. Oh, isn't Julian an idiot? He put that silly idea uh, in, in the wiki. I must change that and I'll fix it. I'll show him. 
uh, that's a great way of getting people engaged if you can actually just find some trigger that will make them want to explain their experience and share it. Okay, so let's move on to another quote. <laughs> oh, some, oh, at least one got a laugh today. Let's see how we get the rest. Uh, are we agile yet? It's quite a common question you get from stakeholders, sponsors, whoever's paying for, for our time, etc. Well, okay, define what you think Agile is. You know, I would like £10,000 worth of Agile, please. Uh, I, <laughs> no. <laughs> Agile's not the objective, okay? Doing Agile is not the objective. Being a highly efficient delivery organisation that produces software on a regular basis that people actually want, things like that, it is a kind of objective that we're looking for here. So if we're setting uh, measures that are around agile things, you're not looking for the right stuff. I quite like my checklist over here. Don't know how. We're doing quite well according to my checklist on the side there. Uh, my agile checklist basically says we're looking at our team. They have a stand-up every day, 15 minutes. Well, hey, brilliant. We're doing well. Uh, we've got a scrum master. Yeah, he arrived a few days ago, and he's been on the two-day course, though, so doing really well. <laughs> Uh, got nobody from the client involved, but don't worry, they'll be all right. Uh, the team, yeah, they're involved in the planning stuff. They're all engaged in the planning. Uh, but retrospectives, no, we're, not, we're a bit too busy to have a retrospective. We'll just keep doing it as we always do. But we're working hard. But according to my checklist, we're now 60% agile. Well, hey, give yourselves a round of applause. That's fantastic. Is that really changing anything? Are we delivering real value into the organization? Goodness knows but so many people want to measure if we're agile yet. <laughs> got to stop that. We've got to start thinking about how can we see increased collaboration? How can we see that we're constantly improving in our delivery and our capability to deliver? How are we learning from our mistakes? Are we using those feedback loops to allow ourselves to improve not only what we do, but maybe how we define that and allow other people to learn from it? That's really important. And of course, if it's not working, You've got to change. Was it Einstein's definition of insanity is the belief that doing the same thing over and over and again will eventually produce a different result. Working harder is not going to make it better. Having written down a method and just doing it without thinking about its change is not going to make things better. So continuous improvement absolutely has to be the foundation around making sure we're agile. Uh, one of my colleagues down here, Dee, is working with me at a client at the moment, and one of the biggest challenges we're facing is getting the client to understand the value of those retrospective moments, the value from coming together and truly not just thinking about what could improve, but actioning those things and delivering those actions, just the top few things every few weeks. It is such a hard culture to break. Okay, so let's go with uh, another quote. Okay, so yeah, I, th I think they've got a point though. They have got a point. I mean, after what I've just said, it's not all about agile, yeah? Uh, so avoid the A word is my recommendation. Do not start every conversation with people about, oh, agile this, agile that. Uh, I think you're immediately going to turn off most of your audience. For me, when I go and start getting involved with an organization and talking to leaders who might be wanting to engage us and work with us and pay for our time around how we might be able to help them. I'm not going to mention the A word for as long as possible. They might bring it up when I start talking about the benefits that we expect from the kinds of ways of working that we're going to put in place. You know, I'm going to start talking about the opportunity for continuous improvement, about the ability to see real results, about not having the kind of the, the classic uh, watermelon-like view of a project. It's green all over but right through the middle it's really red. Uh, or the kind of delayed red moments in projects where it goes green, 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 and then horribly red at the end. We try to avoid some of that classic stuff that goes on, and that's what I want to talk to them about. And if they say, well, some of these things you're talking about, that sounds a bit like that thing I read in the magazine the other day about called Agile. Yeah, that's, that's kind of thing, similar, yeah. Let's make sure we get addressed the key things that people really care about before we start throwing in the buzzwords. And talking about buzzwords, Please don't allow others or yourself to get caught in the trap 
of using the agile fairy dust, sprinkling a bit of agile on a, on a proposal or, or putting the word agile into the project management plan uh, and suddenly believing that the, the pixie dust will now make everything great again. It, it just can't be like that because you're now going to just taint the message and you're going to ruin what people actually should be thinking about and should be working with. So it is about those key things. If you're going to be talking with real business people, they're going to want to understand that all those projects they keep asking for that fail because of the risks and the challenges, you're here to get those feedbacks in to discover and to address risk quickly. That means that when they invest in things, they can predictably get some kind of result. This is the kind of conversation we should be having. Uh, and of course, as I've already said, if we can get some transparency in there, as part of this process and constantly improved, that's really going to help people buy in to the A word. But let's not start that. Start with that. Okay. We're tracking along quite quickly here with these quotes. Let's see how we get with the next one. Ooh, I'll, I'll look at Dee again here. She's shaking her head. Yeah. Uh, Agile doesn't apply to us, you know, you know it's just, just these people who turn up to conferences and people who, who are in the dev team, they're the ones that be agile. We don't, know, we, we don't have to do anything, you know, it's just, just them, change them. Uh, so we've got to make sure that in an organization, the ground, the, the world in which the agile teams or agile development practices and ways of working are going to operate is prepared for them because they can't operate in isolation from change or the support of the rest of the organization. So we must make sure that those in the organization uh, are understand why we're doing this, why are we making these changes, and what it is that they're going to have to do to make that work. Uh, so people must be able to see the problem. That they're not willing to accept the problem, and maybe the transparency I talked about earlier will help them but they must be able to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, there is uh, a need to engage people at all the levels in the organization, uh, sometimes maybe referred to as the frozen middle in the organization, maybe the permafrost layer in the organization chart that I like to talk about as well. I don't know if anybody noticed the, uh, uh, the keynote this morning. Uh, there was a few stats in there about Department managers, they really spot the, the, the stats for the department managers specifically. They were very, very clearly isolated in the thinking of the organization, very stuck in their ways in our keynote this morning. And it's that middle layer that I'm talking about here that finds it difficult to make the, way, the move up because of the lack of ability to use gut decisions uh, and the ability to actually work down because they just truly don't understand what's going on at the levels below them. How do I deal with the permafrost? Well, uh, one technique I've used in organizations before now is that uh, I just let the permafrost layer know that there's going to be lots of kind of briefings and education in the organization because people need to have an understanding about what it is we're trying to work with and change here. But then they're not going to want to go to those sessions because they're for the, you know, the mortals in the organization, those kind of training sessions. They're, they're, they're at a special level that needs special, have special needs, basically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they're at a special level. So I, I always make sure that I advertise that uh, for the special layer in the organization, we're going to have special briefings restricted to just that group, just that audience, none of the mortals allowed, just for those people. We'll be addressing their specific needs and making sure that they are getting a very detailed understanding of what the challenges are today. I get them in the room and we deliver the same old session we normally do to everybody else, of course but they've got to feel like it's for them and it's about them. Otherwise, they're not going to change. Now, obviously, what's the best way of getting that middle layer to understand whether it's worth changing or not? Well, they've got to draw upon success of others that maybe they can relate to. They might not relate to the kind of uh, experience or thoughts of an independent consultant such as myself, if you can get uh, one of their peers who's begun to see the success of this stuff and get them to share their successes with the rest of their community, that's a huge uh, benefit to you as a change agent because they are going to be able to uh, empathize with the person in front of them and the experiences that they've had. Equally, let's, let's promote success 
If we do get something coming out of a team that's working well because of the changes we've made, the agile practices we've adopted, let's get, that, let's get out there and shout about it and make sure that special layer gets to hear about it too. In the same way, again, though, we may start to think about, well, it's, you know, it's a very uh, exclusive club that's allowed to make, go down this change path. It's not for everybody initially. We're going to take certain specific projects and certain specific project managers or middle people uh, that can actually allow to get this undertaking because you know, we're going to have to roll out the benefits to people incrementally. And you'll find there's a bit of a queue forming before you know it. Now, exposing the elephant, that's always a, that's a fun one. Uh, there are going to be plenty of things in an organization that are dysfunctional. In fact, every organization has a lot higher level of dysfunction uh, in there somewhere. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it's not going to be the, the silver bullet bringing in, in Agile. You know, again, as you said, the pixie dust, it just doesn't work. Uh, so we're going to have to get people aware that it may hurt for a while before you start to see the benefits. The point being that the practices that we're bringing in are only going to expose problems, not necessarily fix them directly, but by through exposing them, we've got the opportunity to start addressing them and making a difference. But if they're not going to be comfortable with that, that could be a very difficult period to work through. Uh, and let's make sure we educate with principles. Again, like not RTFM, again, like not just be dogmatic about a method. We have to be have people capable to be able to think for themselves about, I understand this principle, how can I apply it in my context? So we need to educate people about the principles and lots of examples of how the principle can be applied in their environments. Then they've got a chance to be able to make it work for themselves. You may hear, education may be part of what you have to do. Education is not everything in, in change, but education is going to be part of it. I often hear people talk about just-in-time training. I tend to find that doesn't work particularly well. I prefer something that's more like just too late. Uh, why just too late? Well, because when it's just in time, people have no understanding why they need to learn this stuff. I can't see why, what the hell does this apply to me? It's completely irrelevant. Uh, I've just sat here for two days, learned all this stuff. I can't see what, how on earth I could use that in my workplace or any value from it whatsoever. Get things changing, and people have started to see the elephant, they've started to recognize the problems and begin to realize that, hmm, this is a problem, isn't it? Or yes, I can see we're supposed to be doing this, but I can't quite see how we're going to do it well. And so then they've now got an appetite to learn what the, you're now teaching them, because they can immediately start to see the opportunity to apply what you're saying to their current experience. They've gone through some pain, and now they're willing to learn how to address it. So sometimes just too late, obviously make sure it's not too late, too, too late, but just too late, it can be a really effective way of making sure people want to take on what you've got to say. Okay, so here's uh, another one. Yeah, so a bit like, are we agile yet? And, and I, I can't wait, no, not really. And say, oh, just tell everybody. Just tell them. Just basically make everybody just do Agile from here on in. Every project is now Agile, okay? Just do it. It's not working like that. You know, there is, there is no miracle grow in transformation like this. It cannot just be uh, stick the people's feet in the Agile stuff and see them grow. It's not going to work like that. Uh, we, have to, we have to be patient in the transformation process. Uh, whilst... I may work with small teams quite typically because we've got to create exemplars for the organization before the rest of the organization can take the jump to actually try and take that further in their organization. You know, success breeds success. Uh, that again has to be a slow process. You have to be patient with that process. So that starting small can be a really critical way about making sure you get success. Uh, now let's make sure any thin slice in the organization isn't relatively easy. You know, there's no point in trying to attack a simple area where they're very, very uh, uh, receptive or completely receptive to what you're saying. If we're not addressing some challenges as part of our initial adoption, then really nobody's going to have faith that that was actually a difficult thing to achieve. And you won't be able to persuade people that they want to go down the same path themselves. 
Uh, one useful thing to do to get some buy-in into the, into the process of change people are going to go through is a thing that we call a future perspective. As opposed to looking back and thinking how you might be able to take that for the immediate future, we want to be thinking a lot further forward. But not only thinking about the goals we want to achieve into the future, but also thinking about what holds us back today from actually starting on our journey towards those goals. And if when we got that understood, we might then also be able to think about what could actually, with the things we have today, actually help us. You know, so again, try to be really positive about what could it, how this could be done. And finally, what barriers could we find along the way that could prevent us from being a success? Just a classic kind of workshop technique. But through this, you've now got everybody involved in the change, engaged in understanding what it is we really were all here to try and improve, how we're going to get there, and what we can use today to help us pass the obstacles we're going to find. And those future perspective sessions typically are very revealing, very revealing, but they also mean that everybody's bought in to what we're trying to do. Uh, so transparency. Wow, transparency. Uh, I've got another talk about the special middle layer here. The, the, it's really interesting that if you can get the team level to be transparent, that's a great first step. Of course, transparency can be quite a threat to many people. I'm sure you've all come across it yourselves, and you've probably gone through that uncertainty moment too. But when people first hear about transparency of all the work they're doing on a constant basis inside their teams, their immediate fear is that it's going to make micromanagement even worse. You know, they're now going to go, my God, you know, he's, he's on my back all the time, and now you expect me to give him more opportunity to give me grief every day, or him or her. Uh, and no, what we're trying to do for the team level is make them aware of the fact that if they're doing a good job and it's plainly visible to everybody of the success of what you're doing, they're going to leave you alone because they're not interested in dealing with good things that are already working. I don't have to boast about it. Their, in, their, their, their lack of confidence or their lack of uh, 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 visibility in the past is what caused them to micromanage you in the first place. Okay, so that transparency is something we can address at the team level. But now, at the next level up, the transparency at middle management could actually be even more difficult. Uh, we're currently experiencing again this challenge here, uh, and, that, and that environment can be really, really difficult to uh, work with if, if the senior managers are asking for things and they see those only being done, but we know that this middle layer, all the change activity is being hidden, and we know that none of the middle management are actually progressing things, you've got to get transparency into what they do on a daily basis as well. So retrospectives I mentioned already, and typically people think about those at a team level only. No, for me, that's got to be every layer above. They've got to be reflective at, as a leadership team, how they're improving and actually supporting and being servant leaders to those teams. And at every layer above, you've got to get these practices going. So how do we make sure that it's growing and scaling through an organization? Well, there's lots of different examples out there in the industry of, of communities uh, uh, that, that actually where people are working closely together to support each other. Uh, you've got to get those things in place because what, there's one thing to have good agile practices, another thing to be really good at your role that you require to do to be delivering software as well. And we've got to get those cross communities in place so people learn from each other quickly. Uh, and expertise, well, absolutely. You can't learn from a an, an, an lack of complete knowledge. You've got to get some experience in your own teams, but if you can bring some into, of course, that's going to make a massive difference. I've talked about retrospectives already. They are so essential. Again, re reiterate, uh, if you're just banging your head against the wall and not pausing to understand why it hurts, it's going to become an ever more painful process. Too busy to have a retrospective is one of those worst things you can hear in an organization. You know, it's just so difficult what we're doing, we just can't pause to find out why. And last one in there, uh, agile scaling frameworks. They're gonna, there's some good stuff in there. I don't know if anybody's seen the irony of the fact that I called this dangerous when one of the most popular ones out there is called safe. But, um, that, yeah, I, again, 
be wary for me. You know, think about what's in those frameworks. Again, really great intentions, fantastic contents in there. But yeah, let's get back to the, are we in the, in the area of RTFM again? Are we into the uh, uh, over, over accurately wrong as opposed to roughly right? You know, we, we've got to be really careful about swallowing those things and believing they're going to be a perfect fit for my organization. Consider what's in those things and make sure so you can think about the practices that are going to make the biggest difference to what you're doing in an organization. But again, they're so big, often you need some expertise to be able to find the points in there that are really going to make a difference for you. So, I'm going to do a quick summary and then I'll be, should be available for a few questions before we get the chance to maybe hear next year's talk is in the lightning talks downstairs. Uh, so, in summary, I love Agile methods because they give you so much content that you can use in appropriate ways. But they can be made less dangerous because there is a lot of danger in just trying to apply them as they are. You've got to manage that dogma, that belief that once one method fits all scenarios, that you literally can just follow the textbook, do apply exactly what you heard in the two-day training course or more, and, and that's just going to work. No, you need to play fair, you need to manage your religions, you need to be able to get people working closely together. Let's make sure that we don't try to over-guild our method before we actually found out whether it works or not. You know, we, we all um, placeholder for a conversation, is that what it was in, in one of those little uh, phrases we hear in Agile? Let's make sure that we have actually tried to think about this and applied it before we try to overdefine it and make everybody do it. It's really important. Do not people beat people up with the A word. You know? uh, uh, equally, do not set agile as the objective. That's these two lines. You know, the, the objective is to improve. The objective is to find new ways of working through learning by doing and not to believe that just sprinkling the pixie dust is going to make all the difference. And if you want people to listen to you, use their terms that explain their challenges and ways about how to address those challenges without jumping straight into all the buzzwords that our Agile community has got so many of. You're not going to enact change unless you prepare the ground well. You have to make sure people understand the, the imperative for change, you need to make sure that they understand what it is you're trying to achieve. You need to make sure that everybody around the team and in the team understands what in particular it's going to mean for them and what expectations you have of them to be able to make that change a success. And it's not going to happen overnight. I said a number of times, success breeds success. Get something working, make everybody aware of it, they'll want to join in. Make sure people are engaged in what you're doing and then they know what's what might be coming and they'll be less afraid of it when it arrives. And that will allow you then to be able to duplicate, multiply and grow that change culture in the organisation if you want to have any success. And that allows me, with about 10 minutes, to take any questions if you've got any. I'm hoping I might get some for you. Yes, down here. Okay, so repeat the question. <laughs> so the question was, for, for, uh, for, those, uh, for that special community that we've had to create sessions for, uh, have any of them uh, ever given a good reason why it's not going to work for them or why indeed they need to be so special in the first place? Um, uh, I, think, I, I think that in, in the past, a lot of kind of software delivery methodology never really has looked at the organization as, as a whole. It really has been down at the software end and it just looked at people who are being pigeonholed into role types and it never really explored upwards and outwards at the organization around them. So it's quite, uh, it would be quite uh, uh, normal then to maybe expect those people to not think it's about them in any way because this is just another software development methodology. So I think that's one reason why you get people thinking they're special because it, they're not part of it. And equally, that means then, of course, they don't understand the, the, the principles behind what we're trying to get across with Agile. 
so I could see that, that being an excuse. Uh, and, and again, those special people have probably been through lots of kinds of change before. And maybe they haven't worked particularly well. And why should they have to listen to another thing? Uh, so again, there's a bit of cynicism you're having to work through as well to get there. So there, there is, there's a lot of reasons why that special group's there. Uh, and equally, too, they, they've managed to get themselves promoted to a position where they're perhaps not supposed to be involved with this kind of stuff anymore. Or maybe they never could do it in the first place. That's why they were promoted. But um, So again, we're having to basically position it so that they feel this is still appropriate to them because they feel that they're very separate from that. Any other questions? We've got one down here. Yep. What would you suggest to again check whether the people have really done the actions or yeah, that was the done, but then it's forgotten because people do their different introspection and what's the next action mm. without going back to okay. whether have I improved. So let's make sure, so the question is about if we've got retrospectives occurring and actions are coming from them, how do we make sure they're actually being done? and then we actually get those benefits in, in place through the actions from the retrospective. Well, first recommendation is let's make sure that you haven't got too many actions. Because uh, if they end up with lots of actions, you can guarantee they'll start everything and finish none. Classic misbe misbehavior in agile context. Uh, second one is, like everything else, those actions need to be transparently displayed as part of the work of the group and the team and the leadership team especially so that everybody can see the progress on those things and we need to be able to visually see progress on a constant basis. Because otherwise, you know, it'll get forgotten about. Uh, and it won't be seen as important compared to the rest of the work of the team. And thirdly, I'll probably go on forever, but I'll just give you three. Uh, they, exactly, I, they, they know I'll go on forever. Uh, the, the third one is, if it's actions that the team themselves needs to take, Let's make sure that they're actually planned into the capacity of work that they're actually in intending to do for the next period of time before you get to your ne next retrospective. So it's actually something they're allowed to do as part of their planning, as opposed to something that they're expected to do in their free time in the background, which of course is not really what they're measured on, so they won't possibly do it. So there's, there's quite a few things on, on the retros you must get in there. I've got another hand here, yes. Yeah, I was wondering, I, I see you have introduced uh, agile methodologies in a couple of uh, organizations, and probably you've seen a uh, few cases where it doesn't work. In particular, when you, <laughs> when you prepare the ground, is there, are there specific symptoms and you realize nothing is going to grow here? <laughs> 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 you need to retreat. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, do, uh, how do you spot the unfertile ground, should we say? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, there's always warning signs when you get introduced into an organization about what it is they're asking you to do. So again, I, I mentioned earlier, if you've got an exec coming to you, basically says, and how, what, how much agile can I get for 10,000 pounds? It's an immediate warning sign, okay? So uh, that's not necessarily reflective of an unfertile ground, but it's, it's, it's a warning sign that this might not be working in this environment. Uh, secondly, uh, is it, is, uh, what are the objectives for you to be doing this? Okay, <laughs> a massive nod down the front here. <laughs> the, the, what are the objectives for doing this? Another client I was in, we were brought in uh, as, as the poster child uh, of their transformation using our company brand to basically say, it'll all be great because the are here, you know, it's like that. And we were like going, will it? Uh, but uh, uh, we found out that Despite all the talk about wanting to improve the organization, improve the lives of the staff that work within IT, uh, and actually make this a better IT to, to be part of, uh, underneath it all, the only measure they're interested in was, uh, can we get rid of people and reduce costs? Uh, there was no interest in the real benefits that we were trying to, to bring out. Uh, and again, I guess that comes back to what are your KPIs? What are you actually measuring? In their case, they weren't measuring agile things, but they also weren't in measuring pr improvement. The only thing that mattered to them was, was the cost of everything. Uh, and when they began to realize that we weren't actually offering cheaper, faster, for the same original scope, uh, then they began to withdraw. And that message started to, you know, that, 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 the way they reacted to that 
filtered down to the people on the ground really quickly and it, you know, the way they were then being measured influenced massively how they were behaving. So how you measure people influences how they behave. People's behaviour will dictate whether you're successful in your transformation and hence if you've got the wrong measures your transformation won't work. I'll, yes James. Is, is a, to use your phrase, crap retrospective, uh, better than no retrospective at all? I'd have to have way more context to it than that. I, I would say, I, if, if, if the retrospective being rubbish uh, <laughs> uh, doesn't achieve anybody thinking about anything in hindsight, then what was the point of being there? You know, they haven't... But if it achieves the ability to get people thinking about what just happened, even if it doesn't set out better objectives and plans for them into the future, I still think it's beneficial. Because even if a few individuals find a few things smart to change, then you, you might end up in a slightly better place. But I think, though, you, your retrospective might actually highlight the inadequacy of the retrospective. Uh, yeah. And in fact, that was recently something that came up. We're bored of the way you do the retrospective. Can you change it next time? Yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah. Someone puts a sticky up that says less retrospective. Yeah, yeah. What they probably mean is this needs to change because it's not as effective as it needs to be. That was an interesting question, James. Thank you. Yes. We'll talk about yeah, I'm sure we will. Yes, in the middle here. What level you took? Well, is this person part of the team? That middle ground, an executive? What? Give me a good context. Okay, at the product team level, you really need people to understand that they're now being measured about the success of the team and not as an individual anymore. Uh, and so your organisation needs to start measuring people on the success of the team that they're in. Uh, and the progress they're making as the capabilities as an individual and not comparing them as the performance of them against the rest of the team. And that should start to address some of those, the, those behaviours because they're going to recognise that unless they become a team player, they're not going anywhere in this, in this organisation. If they are just an absolute disruptor in that environment, then probably that kind of team is not the right place for them. Uh, I mean, you can change the people or you can change the people. You know, uh, so, and, and you've got the two choices and in that case it may be that you have to take the person to a role which doesn't have to be operating in, in, in that kind of way I mean, you, you could talk about the I have to hypothesize on so many different aspects of what's going on there but there's, there's an example if you're talking the other one was a senior exec or middle did you say senior, senior okay well you're unlikely to be there and help them to, to be a change agent unless you've got a very senior sponsor in the first place so that's obviously maybe not them. Uh, but if it is them, then you may be back to the scenario I talked about earlier where they've actually hoodwinked you into coming in to try and do something that is different to what they're trying to achieve. You need to get that established. In one scenario, we walked away from the client. We literally walked away. It was like going, your, your objectives for your organisation do not align to uh, our ethics about what we're trying to achieve here. Good luck with that. We're out of here. But if it isn't the sponsor, and it's somebody who's a peer to that sponsor, you've got to go to that sponsor and say, you're going to have to address your peer over here, get them bought in, or you're going to have real problems getting any value out of us because they're going to ruin everything that you're trying to get. There was one right at the back. You had your hand up first earlier. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, all right, well, yeah, yeah. so misinterpretation, yeah. Um, often you find out that we've been brought into an organisation because they've actually tried to bring in some people to help 
this, their, their own transformation, or they've, they've got some new employee, or one of the organizations read the book, uh, swallowed it, and, and misinterpreted it, and has been trying to apply things, and it's not necessarily working very well. That's a good example. You know, they, they want to use points as a way to beat the team up on how well they're doing or not, and they want to just use it as a complete direct translation for money uh, uh, or time. Uh, how, do, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, often you need to be able to take them to one side, <laughs> politely, uh, and, and not outside, but take them to one side, uh, and, and just start to explain. Uh, so, so, I think we were next door. We were, we were using questioning techniques in the last session out there. Uh, and it's basically trying to get from them an understanding of what it is they're trying to achieve by what they've learned or what they're trying to apply, inaccurately in this case, so that you can actually then talk to them about what it is that that thing they read was really trying to achieve and that the thing they're looking for probably be better achieved in a different way, if, if at all. So, so you've got to develop some empathy in that conversation to be able to get to the root cause of what they're trying to achieve. There was a feedback point in here. Yeah, you've got to get to the ulterior motive behind it, perhaps, that, that's, that's in there. There was a load of hands over here, but there's a very second persistent one in the front here. Go. Yeah, go on. Um, so when you, when you go into an organization, you deliver that talk at that senior management level. Yes. Yeah, you, the, the misinterpretation is classic challenges. Uh, so uh, how soon can you do all the training courses? Uh, that would be the one, because literally they just think you need to sheep dip everybody and eventually, and if they've been through it, and uh, oh, really, does it have to be that much training? Surely you can get one hour per person and that's it. Everybody will know exactly what to do for the rest of their careers. Sorry? No, 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 exactly. But, but they want to basically do, they, they just, they, that's one of the misinterpretations. They just think it's about a, a, a knowledge imparting exercise to everybody and not as actually a, a, a cultural change. Uh, equally, too, is that, uh, well, obviously you only need to, well, the classic is you only need with the developer, or the other one you get is you only need to work with the managers because the managers will make everybody agile beneath them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the other. <laughs> I think I should finish on the biggest laugh of the day. No, they, that, that, that's another classic misinterpretation. Uh, or the, uh, yeah, okay, fine. So uh, Scrum's the answer then. Uh, so, I never said that. Yeah. Scrum's the answer then. So basically, uh, who's the cheapest uh, certified Scrum trainer out, out there? You know? So it, it, is, it is so many things like this that come out. And again, you can't, you can't blame them. They're trying to think about the cheapest way to, make their, to get their results. But equally, then they're measuring uh, uh, certifications as perhaps the end result, which I talked about earlier, is not a good objective. Uh, we are up on time. I've just noticed that. And in fact, we're over, and I never like to do that. Really appreciate all the questions. Really, really, uh, thank you. My uh, Twitter handle, as has been asked earlier, uh, Julian Holmes up there. And I'll also be tweeting uh, a slide share of all these slides in the next 15 minutes, hopefully. So if anybody wants to refer to the slides, they'll all be up there very, very shortly. Otherwise, thank you very much and enjoy the lightning talks.